voiceover is everywhere, and you hear it every day from radio. Number one for New Country 96.3 Hawkeye in the morning. To TV. Alpha, we just escaped. Recruit a team of teenagers with attitudes. To movies. I see you have constructed a new lightsaber. Your skills are complete. To animation. End game, Spider-Man! And so much more. I don't want to grow up, cause maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Welcome to episode 30. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at the world of voiceover, including movies, TV, animation, and more. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today's special guest is the most more phenomenal and cosmic power in the universe. Let's listen in and find out just who it is. Alpha, we just escaped. Recruit a team of teenagers with attitudes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have David Fielding. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. You know, the very first thing we always like to do, David, is just to get an idea of who you are as an individual, to get to know our guest on the show, and then how did you get into voiceover as Zordon in Power Rangers? I grew up as part of a military family. We moved uh, around a lot. And uh, as part of a military family, you, you change locations every couple of years. And so I learned early on uh, a great way to make friends was to use humor or to use funny voices or uh, impersonations in order to, you know, put people at ease and, and to make friends. So by the time I got to high school and was brave enough to actually start to take theater and drama classes, uh, I had built up this repertoire of impersonations and funny voices and stuff that I would be able to use uh, throughout my high school and college theater time uh, to just sort of hone uh, my skills and stuff. And the uh, one of the first, I guess, voiceover jobs that I ever did uh, was I got my undergraduate degree at Southwest Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And while I was there, they did a film strip or a I don't know if it was completely animated. I think it was a film strip, but they did something about the Edwards Aquifer down there. And I did the voice of this water droplet that uh, would explain to school school kids, grade school kids, uh, about the importance of the aquifer and water conservation and all that kind of stuff. So I guess that was like my first experience at uh, providing a voice for an animated character or something like that. And um wasn't really concentrating on, on doing voiceovers uh, as a career or anything like that, but uh, was more focused on uh, doing stage work and then wanting to do uh, film and television. And so by the time I got to Los Angeles, I really just kind of fell into it. That led me to the audition for uh, the character that I play on uh, the TV show, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. So. Well, that is most interesting because, you know, I didn't realize that you had done other, you know, work in the voiceover industry before Zordon. Um, but, you know, everyone gets a start somewhere, don't they? <laughs> yeah. So you were a little water droplet on kind of a uh, PSA, kind of public service announcement type thing, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if I, if memory serves, it was something that they sent out to like the local Texas uh, school system, uh, but I, I can't even remember the title of it or whatever. It was just something that they had. They were working with like the Texas Water Commission or something like that, and so uh, I think it went all over the state. But I mean, I haven't actually gone back to look to see if I could find anything about it, but it's out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, David, you mentioned going to California, and I know you're back in Texas. So, how long did you end up going, or how long was your stay in California before coming back to Texas? Um, uh, well, actually, uh, it was very short. I was only out in Los Angeles for about a year and a half. Um, I graduated uh, from the University of Pittsburgh with my MFA and, and journeyed out to California to try to do what, you know, hundreds of thousands of people do all the time is, you know, try to make it in the business or whatever. And uh, I got very lucky. I got very, you know, it was one of those lightning bolt kind of things. One of the friends that I had made at my undergraduate school she had moved out to California. I had I had a bunch of people that was living out there when I moved out there. So I had this sort of network of friends from school that I knew out there. And uh, she happened to be working uh, at Saban at the time. She was a uh, second union director or second assistant director uh, for a number of their like straight to video uh, movies that they had done. And then she was 
second assistant director on this um, pilot that they were going to shoot. So I, I had only been living in L.A. for about a month and a half, and I got a phone call from, from Stacy saying, hey, listen, they're having auditions for this character for this uh, TV pilot that we're shooting. And I think you'd be great for it. Why don't you come down for it? And um, I said, yeah, sure. Cause that's exactly what I went out to Los Angeles to do. And I thought it was going to be, you know, a regular cattle call. You'd go down with like 500 other guys. You'd read the lines. They put you on tape. You'd go home and you'd never hear from them again. But when I got down to the Saban building that night, uh, they told us that they were going to cast the character that night and that they were going to shoot it the next week. And I thought, wow, that's, that's very unusual they, that normally it doesn't work that way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, they told us who the character was, what he was uh, supposed to be. They explained that he was this disembodied that, and that he would be sort of like this Wizard of Oz floating head character. And at the time when, when, they, when they had the script at the time, the character's name was Zoltar. So when I got down to the building to do the audition, it was just me and another guy. There wasn't like 500 other people there. It was just myself and this other gentleman. And they told us that they were going to cast it that night and gave us the sides to read, stuck us in a room. And so, you know, we went to each, <laughs> each of us went to a different corner to, you know, try to rehearse or whatever. And uh, he went in first and he did his bit for about 20, 29 minutes and then he left. And then I got in there and met all the original cast. I met the, the writers, the director, the producers, and they had me stand up on the table. And I proceeded to use the voice that they ended up uh, basically using in the show. It was just this deep, resonant, the, this, the image that I had in my mind, having gone through theater and, and uh, I'm a huge tabletop role-playing game nerd, so... okay. Uh, I, I was very used to creating characters on the fly in order to bring them into the, to the game that we were playing on. When I was at the University of Pittsburgh, I also got involved in, in a lot of uh, improvisational theater. So um, that uh, you know, is one of those things that you have to think on your feet. You have to come up with something really fast, and it has to be believable really quickly. So I just had this image in my head after what they described the character was going to be like, uh, this very Mount Olympus Zeus-like character. And that's, that's the kind of quality that I tried to add to the voice. And um, the other gentleman that was rehearsing in the room with me, he, he, he took a different route. He was... His voice sounded a lot more like what Rita's voice sounded like on the show. It was very high pitched, very cackly, and I thought that's really kind of an interesting choice. But I think it's really wrong for the, the character that we were given. Yeah. So when I went there, I, did, I just did this very deep, resonant voice, and that's the one they ended up using on the show. Wow, that's awesome. So did you guys? I mean, did they tweak the voice much, or did they pretty much just leave it as you did it? Uh, they, I think they might have run it through a. Um, uh, uh, an echo chamber and there, there might have been some electrical uh some sort of electrical buzz added to it but i think for the most part it's just my voice but um and you know it's it's my face too so i was gonna ask that as well <laughs> yeah yeah uh the, the the following week after the audition i found myself in a in a makeup chair in a warehouse in north hollywood somewhere and they shaved all my hair off darkened my eyebrows and glued my ears back and i sat in a in a barber chair in front of a green screen and they filmed me for like four hours uh, saying the lines, you know, several different ways and doing different takes of expressions and stuff. And, uh, and then that was that. So. Wow. That is most fascinating. I had, I had not actually known how they did all that. And I wondered if they made you wear a bald cap or if they, you know, uh, shaved your head. So that's cool. I didn't know that you, you did actually have to shave your head for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it 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 didn't sit too well with my girlfriend at the time. She was very upset about it. But <laughs> I was thinking, well, you know, I'm in L.A. Uh, you know, it's my first job. Might as well go ahead and do it. So, and plus, you know, my hair grew back, but you know, it's <laughs> gone away now. But I mean, it was there then. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned only living in L.A. for like a year and a half. So, how long did you actually end up playing Zordon then? Uh, well, my my face was used throughout the life of the character. They kept uh, that was the most it was kind of bittersweet being on the show because um, after after we were done shooting, uh, it was it was just a pilot. They hadn't it hadn't been picked up by by Fox yet. It hadn't been picked up by any of the studios. Yeah, and it's one of those things you always hear about. You know, hey, we're doing a pilot, and we get picked up, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and then they said the same thing. It's like we'll call you when it gets picked up, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I didn't wait around it. And I was like, you know, I figured it was just one of those things that I would do, and then didn't ever hear anything. And like three weeks later, I got a phone call saying, Hey, congratulations. The show got picked up. And I was like going, wow, I can't believe it. I've only been in LA for 
a month and a half and I'm on a TV show, when, you know, when do I report to set? What's, what's my thing? And they said, Oh, by the way, we're not going to film your character anymore. You're just going to be brought into new voices and stuff. Uh, so I was like, Oh, so it was kind of disappointing to know that they were just going to use that footage over and over and not have to pay me for it. I mean, it was very smart, uh, business wise for them because, uh, they owned that footage, but you know, it kind of sucked as an actor because you want to be able to imbue your lines with as much connection and, and meaning as possible when you're interacting with your other cast members. But since I was not interacting with them, I would just go into the voice studio and look at the screen and they would show me the scene and then say, okay, you've got, you know, 3.4 seconds to say this line and they would count it down and I would have to like try to say it. But I, I was disappointed that I wasn't going to be on set. I wasn't going to be interacting with all the characters and stuff like that. Um, and that's, that's, I think one of the factors that led me to leaving LA as, as soon as early as I did, because while it was very cool to be a part of this show and, and I was very excited about it because I'm a big fan of um, Japanese Sentai and Kaiju and all that stuff. And I was also very excited because it was going to be on the same channel that was running the X-Men cartoon. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the character is sort of like this Professor X kind of character. He's this bald mentor um, type character. So, I was, you know, I was pretty excited about that. But I also felt very disconnected from it at a time because I would just be called in every five or six weeks to do voices for three or four episodes. And then, then I would be sent home and I wouldn't hear anything again for like another four weeks and then call me and say, hey, we need you to come to the studio. And then, you know, at that time, I was working like two jobs and trying to pay rent and pay all my bills and not live under a bridge. So I was very unhappy living in LA. And, you know, when I went in to tell them that I was thinking about leaving, uh, the head writer of the show, Tony Oliver, is a great guy, you know, pleaded with me, you know, like, you just give it a six more months, you know, it's going to blow up. It's going to be big. I'm like, oh, I just, I just can't. I was, I was just emotionally drained. I was just worried about surviving. So uh, anyway, to answer your question, uh, uh, my voice is used in the show for the first 31 episodes. After that, uh, Robert Manningham took over as the voice of Zoran after that, but they continue to use my face. Okay. So just for 31 episodes and then Robert took over. Okay. I didn't actually know that. So uh, now I know. <laughs> well, it is sad that you weren't able to continue on with that because I you are the face of Zordon and you, you became the icon that we all fell in love with. Um, so it is kind of sad that you weren't able to continue that on, but you know, life happens and things change and you go with the flow. So, yep. well, David, uh, with playing Zordon on the show, were there any other roles that you ever helped voice or, or did on power Rangers? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think a bunch of us were actually, uh, we added to the putty noises. Uh, all of us were like, you no, know, uh, <laughs> So any, anytime you hear the putties, you know, we were all in there. Doing that. And um, I, I want to say that I did a bunch of growls and uh, what they call punching effects uh, of, of like yells or, or uh, monster screams or whatever. Uh, but I didn't actually provide a voice for any of the other monsters, I don't think. But uh, there were times when we, we were asked to sort of like add a vocal effect to this or that so yeah okay well that's funny i didn't realize zordon was also a putty <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's amazing i'm sure you know getting to be a part of it even though it was for a short time uh, i'm sure it still holds a special place in your heart as it has become such a nationally and actually worldwide phenomenon so oh yeah it was great because the the building that we would do the vo uh, recording in the voice recording was the same building that the star trek the next generation would use to do their adr stuff so uh very often i would like pass you know uh one of the actors from star trek the next generation in the hallway going up to the, to the recording studio so i was like oh <laughs> there i am i'm having a little hollywood moment you know wow. uh then and because I got to know the the sound engineers and and the guys that worked on the show, they also had other projects that they were working on. So I was asked uh, to provide voices for uh, some side cartoon projects that they were working on. That I don't I don't think any of them ever saw the light of day. But um, I know that one guy was working on a uh, series of uh, I want to say again sort of like film strips uh, for for. Uh, Bible study schools, and I, I did a couple of voices for, I think, was it God? I think I did God uh, for uh, one of these like Old Testament biblical stories that they were showing, you know, to to uh, this little biblical 
uh, animated thing that he was working on. So, okay. Uh, but yeah. Wow. Well, you know, Power Rangers has actually been running now this August, 23 years since it initially came <laughs> out, David. That's just fascinating. I mean, for you to be a part of that legacy, I mean, there aren't a lot of shows that have run 23 years and are still running. So, Yeah, uh, when I, because I do the convention circuit these days, uh, my booking agent, um, who's a great guy by the name of Zach McGinnis, uh, he also uh, reps a bunch of uh, Star Wars and Star Trek actors, and we were actually at a show not too long ago in, in Bangor, Maine, where I got to go to dinner with uh, Tim Rose, who was the voice of uh, Admiral Ackbar, and Denise Crosby, who was Tasha Yar on Star Trek. And we were, and he was t- telling us that you know it's these three franchises that sort of um, jump started the whole Comic Con convention kind of thing, um, as far as and and the longevity of these three franchises that people know and identify, and it, it was kind of really eye opening to 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 know that you're part of this pop culture phenomenon. So it's 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 very humbling too, very humbling. I bet it is. What is it like when you have the numerous? amounts of fans come up to you at these cons and share their stories of how you impacted their life or, or whatever they share with you. What is it like for you uh, hearing all that from the, the fans of Zordon? Um, well, it's interesting because up until about two years ago, well, more like, more like four years ago, I really wasn't, really wasn't aware of, of how big everything was. I mean, for me, it was something that I did and it was a job and it was a nice little anecdote that I could tell people at parties and stuff, but I, I didn't really keep up with the show after that. I was, I was too busy doing other things. Um, and, uh, and I guess about 2010, 2011, I started to get a bunch of people, you know, who would message me on Facebook and say, Hey, were you the guy that played Zordon? And I ended up creating a Zordon Facebook page and started getting a lot of, uh, mentions and attention. And then, I think it was in 2011, I got invited to my first convention, which was a Japanese uh, anime convention in Pittsburgh called Takashokan. And uh, that was the first time I actually sat on stage in front of a group of like three or 400 people who were starting to tell me these stories about how much the character meant to them. And it's very, it's very heartwarming and very humbling to know that uh, something that I did one day 23 years ago helped somebody through a very rough period in their life when, you know, they came from a broken home or their father was absent, you know, from the home and, and they looked up to the character of Zordon as a father figure and the lessons that, that they learned from the show that they still carry with it today. That's to me is, is one of the reasons why I continue to go to the convention and stuff is, is because I, 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 it's something that I would like to live up to. It's the, the impact of that can't be, and it can't be denied as far as like what what you do ripples outward. You know, it, it touches so many people that you're not even aware of. And so I, I feel it's it's my responsibility to try to be there and to meet these people to to say thank you for for being a fan, thank you for watching, uh, because I that's important to me. But yeah, it, uh, it's it's very humbling. Very, I, I've heard so many stories of of people who who. Uh, didn't want to go home at night because things were bad at home, but you know the sh- the show would always like brighten their day or something like that. So it's always great to hear that kind of stuff. Absolutely, you know, and I'm sure you've impacted a lot of people's lives because I know you've impacted my life. And hearing those stories from you, it's it's good to know that the work you do as an actor can touch so many lives and and impact them in ways that you never would have ever imagined. Right. Right. Exactly. David, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I know there will be a lot of people that will resonate with that as, as I do. Um, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is interested in pursuing an acting career or a voiceover career uh, who might look up to you? What kind of advice do you have for those fans? Um, well, if, if you're going the acting route, if you want to be on camera, uh, I can't emphasize this enough that you, you have to get a proper training. If you don't go to, to school or to college for it, then you need to find uh, an acting coach uh, to take take acting lessons. Continue to take acting lessons even after you've you've graduated or whatever. Continue to read up. Continue to 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 do scene work. Uh, to you know just keep keep it, it. Acting is like any other muscle. If you if you don't use it, uh, it kind of you know withers or whatever. Um, so uh, you know just keep doing that. Voiceover. Uh, it's 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 so much different now than what it used to be. I used to have a 
a shoebox full of cassette tapes that had my voiceover demo reel uh, that, you know, would be mailed out to whatever ad agency was, you know, doing whatever commercials. I mean, because the way I did my voice demo reel and back in the day was that you would watch the, the commercials that were on TV and then you would try to find print ad of those commercials in the magazine or something like that. So you could actually read the copy or you would take the commercial and, and try to, you know, jot down the, the, the words that were used in the commercial to try to, to try to have some sort of copy you could read that you could put into like these little snippets that you would put together to create a two and a half minute voice demo reel. My advice, if you want to get into the voice over profession is try to cultivate as many different types of accents, different types of vocal qualities that you can. Uh, if you can do impressions, that's great because sometimes uh, a commercial copy will want to have like a John Wayne type voice or a Clint Eastwood type voice or, or whatever. Uh, but any, any type of modulation that you can do with your own vocal cords before they add effects in the studio is, is great because that gives you such a wider range. And because the landscape is different today because of the internet and the digital age, you can upload all that stuff to these various uh, voiceover websites where they have this enormous catalog of people who have uh, voiceover demo reels that are up there. They could just pull them down and read them and say, you know, and hire you on a, on a job by job basis or whatever, rather than going through an agent to, to pick you up like it used to be, but just continue to work that muscle. That that's my best advice is, um, get as much experience under your belt and then just, you know, go out there and, and do it. Audition. Well, David, do you have a way in which people can reach you a website or Facebook or how can people reach out to you? Yeah, I've, I've got uh, accounts on, on three social medias. I've, I've got my Zordon page, which is uh, Facebook Zordon 2012. I've got my Twitter, which is Zordon 2012 and my Instagram, which is uh, DJF Zordon. Okay, excellent. And um, what if somebody if somebody was inquiring about hiring you for a voiceover project, could they reach out through the media networks that way, or would it be through an agent? Or um, well, I, I'm not actually in the voiceover game these days. I uh, if if that kind of thing crops up for me, uh, it's it's extremely rare. Uh, I'm a I'm a writer these days, so I, I spend most of my time uh, writing uh, and crafting stories and stuff, but. Uh, uh, and I've, I've actually started to actually do more on camera stuff these days uh, rather than voiceover. So uh, I guess the answer is that is you know, if they want to hire me, you know, they they can find me. <laughs> I'd love to talk to them about it. But uh, I'm not I'm not actually pursuing a, a voiceover career. And it's very tough to break into um, because much like uh, in the late '80s and early '90s when when I was part of that, they they have what they call these loop groups, or I don't know if they still have them or not. Um, but they're, they're, it's a very tight knit community, and, and they tend to use the same people over and over because they're very reliable and because they're very uh, they have a they have a working relationship with them. So try to to try to break into that, it can be very tough um, because uh, it's very very competitive trying to get into that. So uh, if if you happen to be brought in on a project, you know that that's fantastic because it, I don't think it says as common as, as people think that it's just sort of like, Oh, I want to be a voice in an in anime or whatever. Just go do it. But just be, just be prepared for a lot of doors being closed or, or politely being told, no, no, thank you or whatever. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't keep trying. Absolutely. David. Well, it's always, uh, it's good to hear the truth and, and the reality of it so that people know it's not just, you know, a piece of cake to walk in and just get a job because you want to do voiceover. Right, right. So, David, I have a couple of questions here as we wrap up. What is your favorite cartoon character from growing up and why? <laughs> My favorite cartoon character from growing up is, has to be Marvin Martian from <laughs> um, the, the Looney Tunes cartoons. Absolutely. Um, I love uh, Marvin because he has a very unique vocal quality, and I just love the way the character looks. Um He's just got this very iconic look to him and Duck Dodgers and, and all that stuff with uh, Bugs Money and Daffy Duck. I just, I just love that. But but Marvin has to be my favorite animated character. Uh, most excellent choice. He's actually one of my big favorites and one of the reasons the <laughs> show actually came into being. So that's awesome that we share that uh, fascination for Marvin. Uh, my last question for you today, David, is what is the legacy that you want to leave behind? Um, it, it kind of ties in with what we talked earlier about uh, about the impact of the show. And 
I don't know what it is about the casting process for Power Rangers, but uh, every person that they've put onto the show is is a is a good-hearted person. Every every one of those actors that was cast as a ranger and has put on the spandex and and done all that stuff. Uh, they have these big hearts, and they really would be superheroes if if that sort of thing existed. That's the type of people they are. And so I think my the legacy that I would like to be remembered for is that, and and it's one thing that I'm one of the things about the show that I'm very proud of is that it was it did have such a positive impact for so many people um, because you know you can you can be part of the entertainment industry and you can be a part of projects that really sort of. I'm not really sure if they put out the best message or whatever. It's like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downplaying any of these uh, franchises or anything like that, but I, I would much rather be known for Power Rangers than I would be for something like Saw or um, Nightmare on Elm Street or anything like that. Because I, I think that, I think there's a lot of, maybe, maybe it's just my perception, but I think there's a lot of negative stuff that gets thrown out of this all the time, you know, either news headlines or, there's this fascination with blood and gore and because like I'm a big comic book nerd too. (laughs) And the comic books that I read growing up look different than what they're, what's being done today. And it's, it's a reflection of the, of the, you know, what, what our world is like today. Yeah. Because I, I don't remember, you know, growing up seeing a comic book cover cover that has Thor on it, uh, where Thor is splattered with blood. I don't, I don't remember seeing anything like that. And so, what I would like, you know, is is for the positivity that was that the show generates and and has for so many people. I would like for that to continue, uh, and that, and that's what I try to do with all of my social media and what I do at conventions is try to put out this message of like you know some of the some of the values that you know were on the show and and may sound corny today, but you know it's um, you know trying you know being working together, helping in one another, and, and just being a force of, of positivity and light in the world rather than contributing to the <laughs> massive cloud of, of grim and gritty and, and dark and all that kind of stuff. So Absolutely, David. And I would agree with you highly because one of the things that I really loved about Power Rangers was the moral message that they had at the end of the show and how even Power Rangers teamed up with like the D.A.R.E. campaign to help kids, you know, stay mm-hmm. off drugs and, and don't, you know, at the end they would sometimes have messages of, you know, yes, this is karate, but don't go out and just use it to hurt people, use it in defense and use it in, in the right light, you know. Um, mm-hmm. There was a huge message of positivity that the Rangers used to have and I feel they still have a big positive message but the original episodes from back in the day with Tommy and Jason and, and all the other Rangers they just had something special and uh, it's good mm-hmm. to hear you say that that's what you want your legacy to be because our, our world does need more light in the darkness so yeah I believe so yeah. well David it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today thank you very much Would you please give us a special closeout today as Zordon from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Sure. (laughs) You've been listening to Who Did That Voice with Zordon. And may the power protect you, always. Oh no, Angel Grove is under attack, and I'm the only one here. I've got to protect the city. But wait, I have a podcast to do. Hey everyone, I'll be back as quick as I can. Zordon needs me. It's Morphin Time! Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's more phenomenal episode with David Fielding, the original voice of Zordon from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Hey everyone, and thanks so much for listening to today's episode of Who Did That Voice? If you enjoyed today's episode, please check us out online on all social media platforms at Who Did That Voice and on YouTube at Who Did That Voice 24. Also, remember to check out our website, whodidthatvoice.org. Again, that's www.whodidthatvoice.org. Thank you to all my listeners out there. I just wanted to say, if you want to partner with Who Did That Voice, just telling your friends and family about us is the best way to share the show with others and or leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast from. The third and final way is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash who did that voice. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on who did that voice.